It is so good to be here with you this morning, and uh, to all of you worshiping up in Andover, uh, I pray that you also are having a good morning of worship. Well, fractured fairy tales. Growing up in the 60s and the 70s and 80s, I was a child, like many of you, of network television. There was no Netflix in those days, no streaming internet video, no Wi-Fi, not even DVDs. Can you imagine? In fact, VHS was just coming into its own, and my family never even owned a VHS player when I grew up. So on Saturday mornings instead, we watched old-fashioned Saturday morning cartoons like the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. I can sting, yeah, some of you are <laughs> nodding your heads. All right. I can still, however, unfortunately, sing all those commercial jingles <laughs> that came along with it because it was mostly commercial and just a few cartoons. And they become stuck in my very young and impressionable mind. But I also remember one of my favorite parts of the Rocky and Bullwinkle show and that was the fractured fairy tales. Now, you all know what fairy tales are, even if you don't know what those were, all right? They're made up stories that involve interesting, um, entertaining, sometimes unusual characters and places and events. Sleeping Beauty is a fairy tale, and so are the three little pigs. Now, a fractured fairy tale is one that takes some story that's very familiar to you and then twists it in some way by changing a character or changing the place that the story happens or changing the plot. So an example of a fractured fairy tale would be The Three Little Wolves and the Big Bad Pig <laughs> or Sleeping Ugly instead of Sleeping Beauty. Well, I liked watching the fractured fairy tale cartoons because they always surprised me. They were never really quite the way I expected them to be. Well, it turns out that thousands of years before television was even invented, Jesus perfected the art of the fractured fairy tale. That's right. Jesus made up stories. Does that shock you? He made stuff up, and we put it in the Bible. Now, before you report me to the bishop, <laughs> let me explain. The made-up stories that Jesus told, we call today parables. The parables of Jesus weren't exactly fairy tales because they did much, much more than simply entertain us. They were supposed to teach us something. But they were made up. And just like fractured fairy tales, they usually had unexpected parts, unexpected characters that did surprising things. Well, at least they were surprising to folks who heard them 2,000 years ago. These days, we tend to take them for granted. So this morning, we're going to read one of those most familiar fractured fairy tales, the parable of the lost sheep. And you can follow along with me on page 1623 in the Blue Bibles. We are reading from the Gospel of Luke in the very beginning of chapter 15, page 1623. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, that is, Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me! I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not 
need to repent. This, too, is the Word of God for us today. Well, for many or most of us, this is a pretty familiar story, right? In fact, some people who don't even go to church have heard that story. It's so familiar that it's probably too familiar. We tend to read it and hear it and assume that we know what it means. We see a picture in our minds of a compassionate Jesus, the good shepherd, rescuing the poor little lamb from the side of the mountain. And, well, that's not a bad image, and Jesus really is the good shepherd. But let's take a closer look at this parable and see if we can't discover something surprising. We'll start by looking at what the parable is not, by hearing it in a few ways that Jesus did not tell it. So, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not calculate the average expense ratio of finding one, ten, or fifty sheep? Then determining that seeking one lost sheep is not cost-effective, he calls his friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me. I lost a sheep, but am still able to return dividends to my investors. No, that's not the way Jesus told it. That may be the way of business, but it's not the way of God's kingdom. Or suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not log on to lostsheep.com and locate the coordinates of the GPS tracking collar that he previously had put around every sheep's neck? Then determining the sheep was probably safe in that sector of the wilderness, he emails his friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me. My sheep has wandered off, but I can accurately track its migratory patterns. That's not the way Jesus told it. 